Okay, so today we're going to start a totally brand new unit. It's on electromagnetic radiation. Uh, just before we begin this, let me let you know, uh, I am going to be following the unit booklet for this next unit, of course. Uh, the unit booklet I've actually split into two parts. I called them part one and part two. Both parts are available on the class webpage. Now, I highly advise you download at least one of the, the ones that I put up there. Now, keep in mind, there's ones where it's just the booklet, right? Just part one booklet. That one is totally blank. That might be a good one to uh, download and keep if you want to actually fill in the notes yourself. But otherwise, I actually have my filled in teacher key that I've also posted on there. For some of you, you might find that one more useful. The blank booklet is where the worksheet questions are, though, so those are going to be where your practice problems are. So I just thought I'd let you know before we actually start here. Anyway, so this is the second last unit in Physics 30. We're more than halfway through it already. The notebooklet, blah, 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 it's split into two parts already mentioned. Now, we are going to look at the fundamentals of electromagnetic radiation. That's EMR today. Uh, keep in mind, electromagnetic radiation is basically just a very fancy way of saying light. Now, there's more to it than that, but light is more or less the way we can summarize that. So we're going to talk about the history of EMR today, what EMR really is, how EMR is made, as well as different types of EMR today. It's not going to be really any calculations we do today, uh, so I'm going to try to whip through this as fast as possible because really, let's be real here, you probably could have just read it in the first place, but it's nice to have me explain it to you as well. Anyway, here we go. So scientists, this is not in the booklet. This is going to be one of the few things that's not in there. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell, he would live from 1831 to 1879. He came up with the theory of electromagnetic radiation. So he's the guy at the top right-hand corner here, this guy right here. He's a guy you can thank for everything we're about to do here. Um, but there were a few others that came before him that were also quite significant, including Hans Christian Orsted. He lived from 1777 to 1851. He was the one who figured out that electric currents create magnetic fields. That comes back from our forces and fields unit. You can think about your first and second left-hand rules. When you have a current, let's say, passing through a wire, we knew from your first left-hand rule that your magnetic field would form going over and down across the other side around that current carrying wire, right? Now, the last one we need to talk about is Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday did a lot of different things. He lived from 1791 to 1867. He made a connection between electricity and magnetism. So he was more or less one of the guys that figured out what the connection was. And he also created a rotary device operating using electromagnetism. Now, a rotary device, we're talking like a very simple motor. So basically with some moving parts where it's an interacting uh, electric field and magnetic field. Uh, we've talked about that before as well, so I'm just gonna leave that at that, we'll move on. So from here on, this is what is in the booklet. So the very beginning of the uh, part one booklet for EMR is EMR theory. Faraday believed that there was a connection between electric force, magnetic force, and light. It was not until the 1860s, however, when Maxwell developed the mathematical theory of electromagnetic radiation, or EMR. Now, the EMR theory is based on four principles. The first two were developed by Orsted and Faraday, while the last two were later added by Maxwell. So these four principles are, one, the force of attraction slash repulsion between electric charges in, is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. We're already familiar with this. This was from our last unit. Uh, this was this force formula right here. The electric force is kq1, q2 over r squared, where k is a constant, right? Uh, now, magnetic poles come in pairs that attract and repel each other, much as electric charges do. We already knew that one as well. That's something that came from a previous unit uh, as well. Now, an electric current in a wire produces a magnetic field whose direction depends on the direction of the current. Hey, we also discussed that one too. That was our first left-hand rule, just as I mentioned before, depending on which way you're pointing your thumb for your current, uh, that dictates the way that your magnetic field moves. Uh, and then the last one, a moving electric field produces a magnetic field and vice versa. The interaction between these fields propagates as a wave through space. So basically, if you have an electric field that's actually moving, a magnetic field is going to be produced from that electric field and will also be moving with it. So the interactions between these fields is what actually propagates as a wave through space. This is EMR, this is electromagnetic radiation, and this point is new to us. We have not talked about that one yet. All right, so electromagnetic waves. According to Maxwell's theory, a changing magnetic field will produce a changing electric field, and a changing electric field will produce a changing magnetic field, so it goes vice versa. These waves are what form EMR. 
A constant current flowing through a conductor only produces a constant magnetic field, right? So like that's our first left-hand rule. It was a constant magnetic field going with that constant current. For the changing fields to continually propagate, there needs to be a starting point. An electromagnetic wave will produce a changing magnetic field, which in turn produces a changing electric field and vice versa. Because the fields affect each other, they will continue to propagate through space and they do not need a conductor. So just think about light. Light propagates on its own. It doesn't need a medium to go through. Light even passes through the vacuum of space. It doesn't need something to go through with. Um, that is because there is a very, very rapid interaction between an electric field and a magnetic field happening on a very small scale uh, to produce that electromagnetic wave. It's really bizarre stuff, but this picture kind of shows it. The blue one is a magnetic field. The red one is an electric field. Notice how they act perpendicular to each other. And when you have uh, maximums in both directions, it kind of makes it swing back around to get your minimums in other directions, right? Quite fascinating. It's very strange how this works. Uh, this was a video that I asked you to watch before the video or before this lesson began. So I'm going to assume you already watched it. It is an interesting watch. Usually I would have it here in the lesson, but we will move on. So Maxwell's theory, uh, the sequence of events in Maxwell's, Maxwell's theories of EMR uh, is that Maxwell used experiments to prove that electric fields produce magnetic fields. So he actually did some experiments to prove that. We don't need to go into that any further. Uh, he used calculus to develop equations that supported his theory. We don't need to go into that either. Uh, and he made a list of five predictions with respect to EMR. And if you're interested in what those five predictions were, you can see page 643 of your textbook. But if you don't have a textbook, don't worry about it right now. I'm just going through this anyway. So as, EMR, uh, as an EMR wave propagates, the electric field is perpendicular to the magnetic field and the strength of each field varies, as you can see in that picture there. They act perpendicular to one another and the strength continuously varies. It goes up and down and up and down. Uh, so Maxwell calculated the speed of EMR to be equal to the speed of light calculated a few years earlier. So that's what he believed was going to be the speed of EMR as well. And he pr proposed that light is actually a form of EMR. At this point, they didn't know that. They just thought EMR was its own separate thing. They didn't think that light was tied into this originally. So because of this, he also predicted that EMR could exist in many different wavelengths and frequencies, and they could also reflect, refract, diffract, interfere, and become polarized, which are all, of course, properties of light. Like think of a mirror would reflect light, uh, a lens would refract light, and so on, right? Uh, so properties of light would also be properties of EMR, like radio waves and such, right? Now, Maxwell was never able to prove this theory, though, of EMR. This came later on. They were finally able to figure this out. So uh, speaking of later on, here it is, Heinrich Hertz. Uh, this is the same guy that Hertz, like the, the frequency uh, unit is named after. Heinrich Hertz proved the existence of Maxwell's theorized electromagnetic waves. Hertz built an apparatus that included an induction coil, which allowed him to rapidly change the electric field. By using a circular antenna set a distance away from the coil, he observed a spark inside the antenna. So in other words, even though he was rapidly changing an electric field some distance away from another circular antenna set, he was still able to observe a spark in that antenna, antenna set. In other words, he was actually able to see that there was some sort of action at a distance here, and he believed it had to be caused by electromagnetic waves. It had to have propagated across the room through a wave in some form. So this brings us into the electromagnetic spectrum. So what on earth is electromagnetic radiation? You've probably learned about this in previous science courses, but here we go. There's seven main types of EMR. And they're actually listed uh, in order of decreasing wavelength, not only in this picture, but also in the note package. Uh, and it says include an average energy level for each type. Uh, so if you have a note package and you're copying this in, I know I didn't exactly fill it in here exactly how it would appear in the note package, but basically the seven main forms of electromagnetic radiation going from the highest wavelength, so the biggest wave, to the lowest wavelength are radio waves, which have a wavelength, by the way, of 10 to the power of three, or in other words, 1,000 meters. Radio waves are one kilometer long in terms of wavelength. It's kind of crazy. Then we have microwaves, 10 to the negative two meters. Uh, that would be one centimeter, right? So a, a microwave is about one centimeter in terms of its wavelength. Then you have infrared. Uh, that's 10 to the negative five, which if I'm just doing the math here, I think that's one hundredth of a millimeter. We're gonna start getting into some very strange units here, so I'm not gonna bother anymore, but infrared. Uh, oh yeah, and even like, I forgot, sorry, the approximate scale, like a needle point, right? So that's about the size of an infrared wavelength, uh, the end of a needle point, right? Uh, anyway, visible light is even smaller, of course. Um, those are like protozoans, so like bacteria kind of stuff. 
Uh, then we have uh, ultraviolet, which is 10 to the negative 8 meters. We're talking about stuff that's only about the size of molecules, right? So the UV rays that come from the sun, those rays only have a wavelength of about the size of one molecule. Then we have X-rays, 10 to the negative 10, so about the size of an atom. And then we have gamma rays, which are the most uh, powerful, but also the smallest wavelength uh, at 10 to the negative 12 meters, which is about the same size as an atomic nuclei. Uh, now, in terms of an average energy level, we're not going to get into quantifying this in terms of an exact amount of like joules or whatever, or at least not right at the moment. So what we can say is radio waves have very low energy. They're a really low energy wave, right? Which might surprise you with how big their wavelength is, but a large wavelength indicates a low energy. It's just a, an opposite relationship here. Uh, microwaves are also low energy, uh, which is surprising to a lot of people because you think, oh, if you put something in a microwave oven, it's going to get hot. There's a lot of energy going on. Well, yes, but that's because how a microwave works is it actually causes a specific oscillation of the molecules in your food, particularly water molecules. They really oscillate uh, well with the frequency of a, a microwave. Uh, and those oscillations cause those molecules to rub together and heat up, right? So it's not like the microwave itself has a high amount of energy. It's just that it's causing an oscillation, which is rubbing together and causing friction, which is heating up your food. Anyway, that's a total aside. Uh, infrared is the next one that's also low energy waves, like infrared is what comes out of your TV remote. Uh, medium level energy is visible light, that's what you're looking at right now, like literally what's entering your eye right now is visible light. Uh, ultraviolet light what comes from the sun, that's actually a pretty high energy wave. Then we have x-rays, those are very high energy. Like you ever wonder, you like go to the dentist and your dentist is like, oh here's your x-ray, it's perfectly safe, and then he like pieces out to like a, like a nuclear bunker. I'm just kidding, but you know, like it's because it's a very high energy wave. The dentist was like, getting hit by x-rays every day, he would have a, a big problem. It's safe to have an x-ray every now and then, don't get me wrong. Go get x-rays like every now and then when you need them. But uh, a dentist or a doctor can't be exposed to that every single day. So anyway, it's a very high energy wave that can cause big problems. And then gamma rays are extremely high energy. That's a really, really dangerous one. Um, very high energy waves, but very small wavelength. It's an inverse relationship. Anyway, I explained that for a long time. Let's move on. Uh, universal wave equation. Universal wave equation applies to EMR because they propagate as waves. This is not a new equation for us. We've seen this one before. V equals F times lambda. V is the velocity of the wave with EMR. Of course, that's the speed of light. F is the frequency of the wave in hertz. And lambda is the wavelength in meters. Okay, We've dealt with that equation several times before. Moving on. Uh, waves. Frequency is proportional to the energy of EMR. So a high frequency means a high energy. So therefore, gamma rays have the highest energy within the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's because they have the highest frequency. They're a very high frequency wave, a very low wavelength. It's an inverse relationship, right? Similarly, the color of light in the visible spectrum uh, that has the most energy is violet, right? Violet is a low wavelength wave. Um, so therefore, it's a high amount of energy and also a high frequency, right? Because of the universal wave equation, that's V equals F lambda, frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional to each other. The most energetic radiation has a very small wavelength. There you go. All right, production of EMR. This was a chart that's also in that note package, so I've just filled it in here. It's important to understand how EMR can be produced. We're not going to go into it in great detail because it is often pretty confusing. But if there is anything you're going to take away from this, if there's anything I want you to know about how EMR is produced, electromagnetic radiation, whether it's radio waves, whether it's x-rays, whether it's visible light, EMR is always produced by accelerating charged particles. Okay, Not moving charged particles. They have to be accelerating, speeding up or slowing down. Uh, so fill in the following table. So if you want to look at how radio waves and microwaves are produced, this is the oscillation of electrons in a current producing device. So electrons bouncing back and forth, back and forth. This is why these were one of the first ones to be discovered pretty easily, because just playing around with electrical currents can actually produce radio waves and microwaves. There's a story, don't quote me on this, I just remember hearing it, it just came to mind right now. How microwaves were officially discovered, apparently, was the scientist had like a chocolate bar that melted in his pocket or something because of it? Don't quote me on that. May, you know what? I'll tell you right now. Google it, look it up, see if that's a true story. Tell me if that's a true story or not. Because I have always heard that story and I don't know if it's true and I don't want to be spouting fake information even. But that's what I always heard and I was like, wow, oh, that's interesting. Anyway, infrared radiation uh, is produced by the motion of particles uh, or transition of electrons. Now, by motion of particles, uh, keep in mind how heat operates. Heat is just like moving particles, particles that are like vibrating. 
If something is hot, the particles are vibrating very fast. Or if something's cold, the particles aren't vibrating very fast. Anything that produces heat, generally speaking, also produces infrared radiation. That's why they have those infrared goggles that you can wear, right, that let you see uh, basically where warmth is coming from. So like the police or the military might use it to find someone who's hiding out in like a forest or something, because then with infrared goggles, you can see their heat source. So it shows up as an image on the goggles themselves. Uh, that's because of the motion of the particles on that object. It's a hot object, so therefore that's showing up through infrared radiation. So right now, being warm individuals, we're giving off infrared radiation and we just don't even know it. Like we're, if, if you could see infrared light, people would look very weird. I'll just put it that way. Uh, next up, visible and ultraviolet light. This is higher energy transitions of valence electrons. Uh, remember, valence electrons are the electrons in the outer shell inside of, a, inside of an atom. Uh, you don't need to know too much of that. That's a very much a chemistry thing, but just understand that it's produced by higher energy transitions. So in other words, electrons moving within those valence electrons, and it takes quite a bit of energy to do that. Uh, X-rays are transitions of electrons inside of an atom. Uh, so in other words, electrons going not only from the valence uh, level, but also to the inner level. So it's a much bigger change of energy transition than it would be for visible or ultraviolet light. And last but not least, gamma rays, these ones I always found actually strangely enough to be the easiest to understand. It's the decomposition of unstable atomic nuclei. In other words, if you have something like uranium, for instance, which likes to uh, decompose through radioactive decay, uh, through that process, it releases gamma rays. And we're going to talk about that later in the course. It's actually quite a very interesting part of this course, is talking about how uh, gamma rays can be produced through atomic decomposition. But still, again, it's an accelerating charge particle uh, that is producing gamma rays through that. Anyway, so some formulas. I think we're pretty much done here. Maxwell was correct in his prediction that EMR had the same properties of light. These properties will be looked at over the course of the unit. Initially, write down the formulas and the definitions for each variable. Uh, we could write down the definitions here. I think I'll save you the trouble. First one, that's the universal wave equation. I'm pretty sure you guys know. V is velocity, F is frequency, lambda is wavelength. So maybe I'll just write that one again. Lambda equals wavelength. And that, of course, is measured in meters. Uh, this one you may have forgotten, hopefully not, because we like used it almost an annoying amount of times in Physics 20. This is uh, the time period related to the frequency. So capital T is the time period, and that's measured in seconds. And F is, of course, uh, the frequency measured in hertz. Okay, uh, And then this last one, please tell me you haven't forgotten this one, V equals D over T. Velocity equals distance over time. And you can use this for EMR as well. V, of course, is the speed of light. That is on your formula sheet. It's 3.0 times 10 to the 8, I believe. Don't quote me on it quite yet. Let me look. Uh, yep, 3.0 times 10 to the 8 is the speed of light. I don't know why I doubted myself on that. You can still use that velocity, though, to find distance with time, right? In other words, that linear uh, speed formula still shows up. That was like the very beginning of Physics 20 that we talked about that one. Anyway, we're done. That was actually quicker than I thought, and that's quite nice, actually. So for practice, page uh, six and seven uh, on the worksheet. Now, again, this being our first uh, unit that we're starting uh, since the whole class cancellation thing, you're going to have to access this one digitally. Uh, just so you know, the blank one might be better, please, because on my teacher copy filled in when I was making my answer key, I was like going all gung-ho with it. And I was like, oh, you know what? I'll just fill in all, like I'll do all the answer keys and everything. So I actually filled in some of the answers on this before I just gave up and said, you know what? No, you guys can figure it out. I have the answers posted in a different document. Uh, those answers were done by a separate teacher from a, another school in our district. Uh, but bottom line is for the worksheet, go into the blank one. Anyway, as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. Also, uh, with Zoom meetings, you can have a Zoom meeting with me anytime you'd like. If you need extra help, if you want me to go over anything, please do. I know it's weird. I know it's like this weird transition. But if you want, that is something that's available. Otherwise, if you're more comfortable with emails and stuff, me too. Go for it. By all means, just email me and we're good to go. Uh, anyway, best of luck, guys. Talk to you soon.